Okay, well, this meeting is now being recorded. So if you do not wish to be recorded, uh, you may leave. Um, otherwise, we'll get started. So welcome everybody to tonight's Southwest Florida SEC uh, meeting. This is our monthly meeting. We meet on the third Tuesday of every month at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I see a lot of new faces here. So thank you for joining across the world. I uh, see we have people all the way from Germany and I haven't taught any other countries, but uh, looks like our reach was pretty good this month, uh, posting through different social media outlets. Uh, Josh, our presenter tonight, posting through his network. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, you're, you're also welcome to attend our other monthly meetings. They are open to the public. Uh, so if you ever see a topic and you don't have to be from Southwest Florida to join us. So with that said, uh, we do have a, a great community here in Southwest Florida of technology-based groups. We have the Southwest Florida Coders. I don't know, I didn't see, do we have anybody on from Southwest Florida Coders? All right, so um, Southwest Florida Coders also generally meet once to twice per month, uh, generally also at 6.30 p.m. Uh, one meeting will usually be some form of tech talk. Another meeting is a collaboration uh, meeting where they will um, have different meet, different attendees uh, be there and be available for people with questions. Um, okay, getting a text. Sorry, Jeremy, uh, if you want, you can uh, give a quick blurb about the coders because you probably know better than me. Oh, no mic. Okay, so hopefully I do a good enough job. Uh, they're also on Meetup and on Twitter. Uh, they have a website too. Uh, then there's Southwest Florida Data Meetup. I know Daniel is going to be a little late tonight. Uh, so maybe at the end of the meeting, he can give us a quick blurb about Southwest Florida Data Meetup. There is the Pi Ladies of Southwest Florida uh, teaching Python to, for women in coding. There is OWASP Bonita Springs. WordPress Meetup Southwest Florida and Southwest Florida Regional Technology Partnership, uh, which helps uh, drive and promote uh, technology in the area and build up community. So they're doing a great job. They generally have a, a tech talk or some type of other event each month uh, when they can. And I know a lot of us have moved to virtual meetups. All right, so we got a lot of upcoming events. We have the Southwest Florida Data Meetup, like I mentioned earlier. Their next meetup is going to be on September 21st about the economics of data. Uh, Sarasota InfoSec community. Uh, John, you're here. I'm going to let you uh, do the announcement for that one, if you don't mind. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we have uh, from No Before, Eric Cron. He's going to be talking about fake news and deep fakes, not from necessarily the news standpoint, from the tech side of it what that means for the future, how that's going to be the difference between phishing now with just text and audio. Imagine what that will be with video and uh, faking audio. So there's all kinds of other things you can do with, with fake news and deep fakes. So we'll be touching on that tomorrow. I can send a link if anybody's interested in that talk. I can put that in the chat. Yeah, if you would, please. All right, thanks, John. Uh, then we have the ISIS South Florida chapter and joint meeting with the uh, South Florida OWASP chapter. Um, George, you're here. I know you're one of the presenters. If you want to give a quick blurb about that meetup on Thursday. Hey, sure. No problem. Uh, so, yeah, we have uh, technically three speakers. It's going to be uh, kicked off by Rohini. Um, uh, I can't really pronounce her last name, so God help me with that. But uh, if anybody knows her last name, she's um <clears throat> well involved with uh OWASP and she's going to be talking about uh securing the uh, AWS cloud and myself and Stephanie Thomason is going to be uh talking about um helping people pass the CISSP if anybody hasn't passed that or is anybody struggling maybe our tips and tricks of the trade can probably help us so that's what we're going to be talking about this Thursday all right thanks a lot George uh, I'm looking forward to attending both Sarasota and ISIS South Florida uh, chapter meetings this week sound they both sound like great meetings uh, then we have Isaka South Florida doing a meetup for autonomous decision making and data analytics on 
September 23rd, I almost said November. Uh, that's coming up though, there's other meetings. Uh, Hack Miami in, on the 19th, Introduction to GNU Radio and the MISP Framework. Uh, Southwest Florida Coders, October 8th, Artificial Intelligence at Unity, uh, and that's going to be an online meetup. Southwest Florida Regional Technology Partnership is holding their annual Tech, Mo tech Match uh, virtual job fair on October 15th. And we also have a bunch of these sides coming up, and many of these have moved to virtual, so you don't have to actually be in the area anymore to attend the B-Size. So we've got B-Size Denver uh, coming up on September 18th. We've got uh, OSINT training with Elif uh, on September 26th. Now that is going to be midnight Eastern time. It's going to be, it's more for the other side of the world, but I know I'm going to it because so it's going to be well worth it. Plus it's in support of the um, Innocent Lives Foundation. So the proceeds from that training will go to them, which is a great outfit. Uh, there's B-Sides Boston uh, September 25th and 26th. ShellCon on the opposite coast on October 9th and 10th. B-Sides Orlando is now scheduled for November 6th through 7th. And then you can find out additional B-Sides conferences at the link below. Does anybody want to add any events to this list? Okay, moving on. Uh, now as part of our meetup is tell us your needs. This is a time for any of you to uh, announce that if you have job openings or if you're looking for a job or if you have a specific technical question outside of uh, the job search. Yeah, uh, I guess I'll go first. So uh, my name is Eric Spanko. Right now I'm uh, looking for a job, any entry level positions. I'm a recent graduate from Florida Gulf Coast University. And, you know, I've been applying for a lot of entry level, you know, help desk or technician sort of positions. So if anybody has any, you know, positions available or that stuff or know somebody that does and maybe I could, you know, reach out to them to see if, you know, maybe something could happen. All right, thanks, Eric. Is there anybody else? Uh, Michelle, I'm gonna pick on you. Do you wanna give a quick announcement of job openings at Arthrex? Uh, right now, we don't have any. <laughs> okay. We've had some uh, listed, but we've done some hiring, uh, George being one of them. And uh, we brought another member from outside of our team within the company to our team. So right now the positions are on hold until uh, I guess for the next near future until we hear otherwise. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. So everybody keep an eye on Arthrex's job board if you wanna come work for Southwest Florida and never know when an opening might come up. It's a great place to work and it's a great environment too. Anybody else? All right, go on, move on to what everybody's waiting for. It's our presentation on modern, well, modern mal malware, detect, analyze, and reverse by Josh. Josh, I'm gonna put your last name, Strosheim, Strosheim? Uh, you're close, uh, Strosheim. Ah, Strosh, okay, Strosheim. All right, so Josh has been grateful enough, or, or grateful, not grateful, has been gracious uh, <laughs> enough to agree to give us a talk tonight uh, we sure appreciate you coming in from all the way from South Dakota uh, to teach us all about modern malware and then how to dissect it and all the great tools to use and everything else. So I'm going to take let you take this away. So let me assign you host. Okay. And okay. And. All right, so hopefully everyone can hear me loud and clear and uh, see my screen. I should just be sharing my desktop. So uh, my goal here is to, uh, well, once I get that full screen down, uh, to be able to just bounce back, uh, bounce back and forth between my desktops. 
Um, if anything, if there's any issues with that, please let me know and I'll go ahead and correct that. Um, I think I, I may have overestimated how much time I, I talked to Mike about that a little bit earlier and that uh, he said the meeting was from, from 6.30 Eastern to 8.30. And, and so I thought, oh, two hours, I'm going to talk for two hours and I'm going to cram a bunch of material in there. And then I was looking back at some of the previous communication we had and he said, yeah, I talked for about 45 minutes and, and then 15 minutes of Q&A. So uh, I'm going to shoot for somewhere in the middle there. Uh, I certainly won't be offended if anyone needs to drop off if I start going long. Um, as you can see here, uh, one of the things that I've done for the last few years is, is teach at a university. And um, earlier in my career, I was terrified of getting fr in front of a group of any size and talking. Um, and after a few years of teaching, um, now it's, it's hard for me to stop talking. So uh, I guess that's a, a skill or, or something that I've developed. Um, thank you for the opportunity, Mike, and for everyone that's, that's a part of uh, South South Florida SEC for the opportunity to present. Uh, Mike reached out to me on LinkedIn and, and we had a great call. So it seems like just a few days ago, it's been now several months and uh, it's amazing how much has changed in the time since we last spoke. Um, really excited to, to have an opportunity to talk to you. Um, I'm passionate about sharing the things that I that I feel I'm good at, uh, and malware analysis and, and reversing is one of those things that I just I love talking about. So um, I could go on for, for quite some time tonight, but I'll, I'll try to keep it uh, somewhat focused. Um, as far as uh, how to run the meeting, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with anybody jumping in at any point in time. If there's something that you want me to maybe talk a little bit more about, if something I said wasn't clear, um, you know, please feel free to just uh, unmute yourself and uh, and just jump right in. Uh, I do have the chat open, so I'll try to, to look over on my other screen and, and keep an eye on that. But uh, like I said, audio is probably the easiest. Um, my plan for tonight is just to go through uh, a few slides here. I, I had a, just a, a few more, but I'm going to cut those out and just get right into some live discussion. Um, what I'd like to discuss with you then is just my process of how I do threat research and, and threat analysis and just kind of take you through a holistic approach of, of some of the tools I use, uh, some of the approaches I take, the things I look for. And, um, you know, keep in mind that, that even if we went the full two hours, uh, there's a lot of tools, there's a lot of techniques that we could spend a significant amount of time analyzing, discussing, discussing, talking about techniques for usage. And, and so this is going to be very abbreviated. There's going to be things I'm not going to be able to cover. Uh, we're not going to be able to get into all the nuances and, and the edge cases. Uh, but hopefully this gives everyone one, you know, a pretty good idea. Uh, a quick background about me. Um, I feel fairly confident that that picture still accurately reflects who I am, um, although it's a couple years old now. Um, I, I have a little more gray, I suppose, than I had in that picture. Um, I teach at Dakota State. It's a, a small college here in the Midwest. Uh, we have uh, the CAE designation through the NSA. So we have cyber operations, cyber defense, uh, cybersecurity type programs, all the way up to the PhD level. Um, been there for a few years now uh, and primarily teach malware analysis and, and reverse engineering. Um, I've been with Bromium as a, as a contractor for, for some time now. They've recently been acquired by HP. So I guess now I'm an HP contractor, uh, primarily doing threat research and, and helping with product improvement and other stuff there. Uh, I've been with OISF, which is the, the foundation that um, manages or, or supports the Suricata project. Um, you know, I'm helping them with their training and some of their outreach efforts. So uh, if you're following that community, you might come across webinars and, and other things that we're doing there. I've uh, been authoring with Pluralsight. Uh, that's an online learning platform. Um, have a few courses there, of course, all around malware. Uh, and I've just hit my uh, 19th year in the National Guard. So um, can finally see uh, retirement here just around the corner. And uh, I'm part of a, a cyber ops squadron there. Um, so largely blue team stuff. Contact info, uh, pretty easy to get a hold of. Um, I'm fairly active on social media. That's something that I have avoided most of my adult life until this last year. Um, and I've been trying to just contribute more back to the community uh, via LinkedIn and Twitter. So you'll certainly be able to find me there. Email is also good. Um, and then I, I tend to bounce in and out of a lot of different slacks and, and I guess discords now as well. So uh, if there's a, there's a chance you'll find um, my username, I'm not very creative. I don't have a very creative handle. Um, so being able to find my username in there. Um, let's see. So normally this is a, a kind of a portion of a, a larger workshop or training uh, that I give. So we really start at the beginning of talking about different um, 
ways of analyzing malware. And it's kind of like going through MITRE ATT&CK in a lot of ways And that we look at delivery mechanisms, we look at how threat actors, you know, what are their TTPs, their tactics, techniques, and procedures, what tools can we use to investigate, what is the, the data that we want to collect, and how is that beneficial for us? What can we use that data and plug it into um, our defenses or our greater understanding of how this adversary is operating? Um, as a malware person, it comes, you know, malware comes in a lot of forms, uh, whether you're, you're researching or defending the instant or you're maybe part of a red team and you're trying to create the tools to test an organization. Uh, Java, Flash, fortunately Flash is, is something that's finally sunsetted. Um, Visual Basic, uh, .NET, Java, low-level code, shell code, um, debuggers, disassemblers, you name it. Um, and, you know, in any particular investigation that you're doing, for whatever reasons, you can find yourself going from analyzing a malicious office document to uh, disassembling shell code or native code with a disassembler like Ida and Ghidra, you know, all just in, in one investigation. And so it can be very... It, you know, the, the tool set and the skills needed can be very, very broad and, and very complex. Um, I'm going to use this as sort of an, a common attack scenario for today. You'll see it, it kind of roughly or loosely maps to the MITRE attack um, and that we're, we're looking at how um, threat actors are are going after users and organizations. Very common way right now is email attachments to you know, phishing emails, so Office documents, Word documents, and Excel documents. Um, I don't know if I'll have time to get too deep into the Excel for macros, but if um, you've been keeping up to speed on those, you'll know that those have become you know, fairly prevalent in the last few months. Probably, I really notice an uptick in them, you know, probably in, in February, March. Uh, old technology that's been around in the office suite for quite some time. It's never been sunsetted by Microsoft, and so it just continues to exist. And now, um, you know, bad folks have been able to, to take advantage of that. And, and, and it changes our tool sets. Our tools are, are slow to evolve. Our sandboxes, it causes some issues with some sandboxing. There's, there's just sort of this leg that we have to, you know, identify that there's been a change in TTPs, and, and now we've got to catch up to it. And so those have been very, very prolific and very effective lately. Um, these documents then uh, typically don't live in and of themselves. Um, oftentimes they are going to execute or use macros. Macros are just a normal part of the office suite. We can create macros and attach them to docs and, and spreadsheets uh, or use Excel for macros. There's, there's nothing abusive per se about those. Um, the, the zero days, while they do get discovered from time to time, um, certainly when they're discovered, they, they're going to be abused. They're just not something you see in the regular bulk of, of like daily malware and mal spam. Um, they're pretty valuable nowadays. We're pretty quick, I think, as an industry to identify when they're being used, um, and that can lead to patching. And, and so they're just you know, and, and not all of the criminal orgs and the threat actor groups are going to be sophisticated enough to, to field their own zero days and be able to abuse them. Uh, that doesn't mean, of course, that once they are observed, blue, Eternal Blue is a good example. Once that was, was leaked and became publicly accessible, a lot of groups were very quick to adopt that and, and use that to their advantage. Um, these macros then, so they're going to typically run some additional stage, PowerShell, uh, JavaScript via C script or W script, the console host. Um, maybe it's maybe it's an executable at this stage, although it's it's much more common right now to see something like PowerShell or JavaScript. Uh, and that's going to reach out to another host, a domain somewhere, a compromised server somewhere. And that's going to bring down that that primary Trojan, that primary payload. And then it's that payload that is going to begin to persist. It might reach out for additional C2, some initial fingerprinting, maybe some additional modules, maybe additional malware is going to come down, deciding if um, you know, threat actors go interactive, if they're going to try to just whatever they're trying to accomplish. right? And so we have all these different phases. We have different artifacts. It takes different tools to investigate. There's different indicators of compromise or indicators of attack that we're interested in. Um, and so it's, it's good to understand what to do at each phase and what, what, what each thing represents. Social engineering is another part of it. Um, and that typically when we have the, you know, the earlier phase, someone is in an attack, they're more likely they're trying to encounter the user and that the, the, the more important that social engineering becomes. So social engineering in the email, social engineering in the office document, um, Hey Mike, you just want me to admit anybody that enters the waiting room, right? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, here's another one. <laughs> they just they just popped up on my screen. So, um, anyways, uh, 
Oh, no, it's one of those days I just lost my train of thought. So anyways, um, it, it's, all very, it's all very important to understand these different phases because it, it oftentimes drives, um, you know, the, the, well, the social engineering, oh, the social engineering, and then eventually the social engineering becomes less prevalent to, to the point where it goes away because once an adversary is compromised the system, now they want to, to try to remain below the radar and, and be stealthy. Um, there's a, a few slides in here. I'm just going to skip. I'm happy to share this uh, slide deck with anyone if, if you want. There's not a lot in here. It's just covering some of the basics of um, some of the basics of malware analysis, which we'll talk about here when we get into the sort of the hands-on portion. Um, lots of tools. There are a lot of tools that we that you can utilize, and I know I utilize on a regular basis. Um, sandboxes are definitely a big part of that. Um, I run you know, things like Cuckoo, I take advantage of public sandboxes. Um, and those are a big help because they, have, they provide for that, that ability to dynamically execute something to observe the behavior to try to get really a quick summary, a quick digest and even, you know, data out of that sample very quickly, um, or relatively quickly. Uh, of course, malware authors are wise to that. They do things from time to time, anti-analysis, they try to observe if they're in a sandbox environment, alter their behavior, provide bad data, whatever it happens to be. So with every tool, there, there is going to be the pros and the cons. There's certainly going to be uh, attempts by you know, the malware authors to try to uh, subvert that tool or try to make the use of that tool less effective. Um, uh, analyzing office documents, there's a whole number, you know, a whole suite of tools that I tend to use. OLE dump is, is certainly one of those. OLE VBA and some of the Declish tools. Um, all of those are just common you know, tools that I go to when I analyzing those, those office documents. And we'll get a little bit of hands on here with OLE dump in just a few minutes. Um, analyzing the network traffic is a big part of it still for me. And I use Suricata as an IDS. I am of course biased in that I, I work for OISF, the foundation that runs it, um, but also because it provides not only the ability to create those IDS alerts, but uh, protocol logs. Um, so HTTP, FTP, a, a whole number of different protocols that it can parse out and, and pull TLS information, J3 hashes, file extraction. And so using it in, in complements with a sandbox, a, a lot of sandboxes do, Cuckoo supports it pretty much out of the box. Um, running Suricata in offline mode to process a PCAP. Um, you know, so grabbing a PCAP from some source and running it through to see what kind of IDS alerts are generated. Uh, there's still to me a surprising amount of malware that I, that I encounter that is not using um, encrypted communications. And, and even those that are, there are still some things that we can do in order to understand a little bit more about that threat. Um, of course, when we get into native code, uh, PE Studio is one of my first go-tos for analyzing PE files. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that here as we get to the end. This takes something like a, a complex binary file format, parses it, digests it for us, and provides essentially analyst-ready, human-readable information. Um, as you see in the title, it is malware initial assessment. So it's really something that we can utilize to take a file, a PE file, once we've recognized that type, um, drop into PE Studio and get some initial assessment, get some initial feedback. Um, as you can see, virus total results, overall indicators. And, and one of the great things about a tool like this is that it, it takes that information and not only does it try to parse it into something that's human readable, but then it also highlights things that should draw, that you should be paying attention to. And, and that's what we see with those indicators. So we'll take a look at that in a little bit more detail here before we wrap up. Um, IDA, I use IDA pretty regularly still. There's a free, there's a demo, there's a license, there's finally an academic version. Um, and we have had some luck on campus uh, getting those licenses. Um, I'm so really pleased to see that because um, for quite a while, it, it's, it's been a struggle to figure out how to get uh, IDA in the classroom. Um, use it for a lot of things. There's actually some simple analysis techniques that I use IDA for. And then of course, there's the more prolonged, let's take some binary and let's disassemble it and then let's trace through the functionality. Um, there is the decompiler. Uh, that's something you have to pay for. And, and so getting a license from IDA or, and or buying the decompiler can, can get a bit expensive. And I think that's usually the barrier for most getting into using that tool. Um, Ghidra is now available. We'll talk about Ghidra yet tonight. Um, Ghidra is available by the National Security Agency, the NSA. Um, it's, it's interesting because we have a lot of our students that intern at the NSA. And so for a couple of years now, I've been hearing, you know, slow mumblings about some tool that the agency was going to release and that it's really cool, but we just can't say anything about it. Um, and I thought, okay, great. You know, it's either going to be really awesome or it's going to be kind of a dud. 
Um, and I think it's turned out to be pretty great. It's, it's definitely been well recepted by, uh, received by the community. It's quite capable and that it, it does the disassembly well. It has all the features that you would expect more or less from a disassembler or a software reverse engineering framework. Um, and then it provides that decompiler and it provides it at no cost. So, um, you know, thanks a lot. That makes teaching this a little bit harder because students have a decompiler now, but it's also the reality of the world we live in. And, and I think in the long run, having those capabilities and, and training our students to it to help is a great thing. So it's, it's really a great tool to see. Um, we don't have to disassemble everything. Uh, we might run across files like PE files, or I'm sorry, .NET files or Java files. Uh, while those get compiled, .NET files get compiled into the PE file format, um, they're actually bytecode that is then executed by the .NET runtime. Um, very similarly with uh, Java. Java is bytecode that is then interpreted by the Java runtime. And so with that bytecode, it's a little bit higher fidelity information. We can use decompilers and that helps us to what is going on? Um, that can help us then to look at something in C sharp versus assembly or pseudo C from our decompilers. Um, talked a little bit about O'Day. Don't need to touch on that anymore. Um, and then just some quick kind of overall, like what are we dealing with right now? Um, we'll, we'll use the URL house from abuse.ch. This is a great project. I find myself using the, the URL house from abuse.ch as well as the malware bazaar all the time. Um, one of the things they offer with the URL house then is, is the community can submit URLs. Um, I don't know where else they get their data, probably a lot of their own scraping and their own analysis. Uh, those URLs then um, pull down payloads, so typically executables or executable content, and then you know, trying to download as much content as they can, and then as well as identifying that content. Um, and so they provide the statistics from this, from, you know, the content they see based off of their signatures and their analysis, as well as then the tags that are associated with those payloads that are dropped. Um, so you can go to abuse.ch anytime, go to this URL, and you can see what's some of the top threats that they're seeing. Um, as with any platform, their data is limited to the sources that it comes from. So just something to keep in mind. Um, and you can see here that uh, Hyodo, Hyoto, TrickBot, QuackBot, Gozi, um, Hyoto being Emotet, um, those are some of the top threats. And, and Emotet definitely is one of those that when it's active, and it is, seems to be in one of those phases where it is very active, uh, it really dominates in terms of just how much mal spam and just activity that they generate. Uh, similarly with the tags, here you can see some of the top tags. Um, it's, I, I thought initially when I looked at it, I was a kind of surprised to see ELF as one of the top tags. Um, ELF is the executable linking format. So it's, it's like the PE file, but for Linux. Um, but then I thought, well, you know, it kind of makes sense uh, that with IoT devices, a lot of them running Linux, um, that likely it's all related to that. Although I still wasn't, still a bit surprised that it was that high. Um, outside of that, Emotet, XE, Hyodo, Doc, maybe Mirai is, is then helps to, to uh, kind of help back up my analysis there. Uh, but all of that is, is more or less what we'd expect. Uh, if we shift to the malware bazaar, these are the tags that they have applied to the payloads. So the actual binaries versus the URLs that they come from. Uh, and again, it kind of looks the same. We've got Emotet and then some commodity stuff, Agent Tesla, Google Order, Forum Book, TrickBot. And this is good, right? This, for me, I use this information all the time because it helps me to anticipate the threats I'm gonna see when I'm out there trying to do some research. If I see something is, is prevalent and I don't understand how it works, then I try to find those samples and I, and I try to learn more about it. How does it operate on the system? What is this process activity? How does it you know, touch the file system? What type of network traffic does it see? Does it use unencrypted communication or encrypted? Um, what does its command and control or its check and beaconing activity look like? And so we can grab these samples, we can get them from directly from Malware Bazaar and, and, and do that analysis. And then um, I use that to, again to get kind of smarter about those threats because then in the long run, it, it makes it easier for me when I'm looking at my malware to understand what I'm looking at and identify it much quicker. Um, Any Run is another great platform. It's a commercial sandbox that has a free tier. They have their their trend tracker. So again, they're some you know they're going to be limited to the data that gets submitted to them and, and how they acquire that. Uh, but you'll see it. It paints a very similar picture. Emotet, Agent Tesla, and JRAT, Loki Bot, Rimkos, um, with Emotet of course being the top top threat night now just because of the sheer volume. <laughs> okay. Yes, it is. PC is a great tool. <laughs> okay. So um, everything I want to present here uh, is 
is free and open source. So you either there, it's an open source project that you can take advantage of, uh, utilize, or it's, it's, there's, you know, a, a project like, um, like P studio, like Ida pro, um, that is, is, that does have a commercial component to it, but then it also has a community edition or a free edition that is also quite powerful and capable. Um, as you can see here, this is Cuckoo. This is the, just the latest Cuckoo. Um, we could talk about Cuckoo for a while. It's a great sandbox. It's been around for a while not as maintained maybe as it used to be. Um, and so there's some creeks in it and, and using it as a platform, but, um, and there's of course forks, right? Uh, so there's the Cape, uh, the Cape fork, uh, C-A-P-E that's, that's available. That's, that's probably a little more active. Um, and so certainly there's, there's different avenues that you can look at, especially with these open source projects and, and now with all this, this GitHub stuff and, and the ability to fork these. Um, what I like about Cuckoo is it's uh, ability then to create my own environment locally. So I can, I'm in control. I create the VMs. I understand what goes into my VMs and the software I have there. Um, I can integrate with other tools like Moloch and Suricata and, um, and, and do customizations if I want to. So that's really powerful. Um, I can submit to it. I can integrate. A lot of my, my workflow is automated. Um, I go to, you know, uh, abuse.ch. I pull threats down from their API on a, a cron job, essentially. So automatically submit them to Cuckoo. And then, so then I have that analysis going for me, even when I'm not manually submitting things. So that's very helpful. Uh, of course, on the flip side, it means that um, you have to do all the work. You have to have the environment to run it. You have to build it. You have to maintain it. Um, if functionality isn't there that you want, it's up to you to figure out how to get it, if it's even possible. Um, and it is just a lot more work. So um, pros and cons to everything. Um, I certainly use a lot of public sandbox as well. And so, you know, getting into uh, any run and, and Joe sandbox and hybrid analysis and, and a lot of those. So um, it's, it's being able to use a little bit of everything. Now with uh, Cuckoo, um, as with many sandboxes, um, they have this ability to try to, or they, they, they try to identify threats for you. And so one of the way that Cuckoo does that is through the scoring system. So it has signatures and other, um, looks at other events to say, you know, this has a weight to it. And this weight then once the analysis is over, we can summarize this and, and give it an overall score. So we can look at significant events, right? We have, you know, a score 20 and 13.2 and 15.4. And definitely a lot of things happen there. Combination of process and network activity. Um, but then we may have on the other end of that spectrum uh, samples that have a lower score. And those can also be interesting to analyze because they can reveal anti-analysis. They can reveal maybe flaws in how I have my sandbox set up or flaws in and maybe limitations in Cuckoo um, because of Josh? just... Yeah. Sorry to bug you, but um, from what we're looking at here, are these samples that you uploaded to the system to have analyzed, or what is this? Yeah. So, um, so these are all samples that I submit regularly. I pull most of my samples as just a, an independent researcher. Um, hybrid analysis has an API, uh, a limited number of samples on their API, but they have one. I, I pull from there. Um, I also get a lot from abuse.ch, so either pulling directly from the URL house URLs, so downloading those payloads directly, or um, getting the payloads from abuse.ch once they've acquired them. So, okay, yes, so these I are hashes that are being pulled from different sites. So, yeah, so these are the actual okay. executables. Now I understand. Typically, when I download them, they, just, they give the file name, the hash name, and then so I submit by hash. Well, I'm sorry, this is the hash. This mm -hmm. is the file name. So sometimes if I find something and I upload it, Right, like this one here, I found this the other day, I was analyzing it. This is the original name that was given on the server that it was residing on. So I just downloaded it and dropped it in. Um, these typically come from some API somewhere, abuse.ch or hybrid analysis. Okay. So yeah, these are the names and, they're, and then they're somewhat arbitrary. They're whatever you submit the file as. Um, typically your sandbox will determine the file type for you or hopefully it does and then it'll execute it appropriately. So if this was an XE, it'll upload it execute it. If it's a doc file, it'll upload it to your sandbox um, and run it through Word. And then this is just the summary. So these are just all the threats that I've run through my sandbox in the last, well, the most recent ones. So uh, today, I guess I ran some through today. Did that answer your question? If I can unmute, I can say, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> great, great, great. 
Um, okay, so um, as I said, uh, the scoring, um, you know, it, it has its flaws as well. Uh, we, could, we could talk about that, but um, it, it can still provide insight. Um, so like I said, normally the higher the score, the, the more activity that occurred, the lower the score, the less activity, but that doesn't mean that those low scores aren't interesting. Um, oftentimes I'll submit things in bulk. And so I'll get a lot of, uh, the, of a similar sample, right? A lot of emotet from today. And while all the hashes will be different and maybe the C2 will be different, it still largely behaves the same. And, and then you tend to see that in the score. And so here we have a bunch of 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, right? There's another 0 0.8. Um, I might just grab one of these with that score and, and look at it, investigate it, and try to figure out what's going on there. Why, why is the score so low? Is it anti-analysis? Is there something wrong in my VM? Is there something wrong with Cuckoo? What is going on? Um, there are, let's see, um, another integration. So that's, that's how I sort of tease out things that are interesting to me. Um, from just the sandbox perspective. And then we'll, we'll jump in and analyze a couple of samples here in just a moment. Um, the other thing I use is Moloch. Uh, Moloch is, uh, be careful if you search for Moloch. Um, I guess that is the, uh, I came across the Wikipedia entry the other day. It's the God of Child Sacrifice. So some kind of strange things out there. Uh, but it's also this really cool tool <laughs> that allows you to essentially have Wireshark on top of Elastic. Um, so with Cuckoo, you can tell it, once it's done processing your, your sandbox, take the PCAP, submit it to Moloch. Moloch will index it into Elastic and provide you this interface that allows you to go back and look at the traffic. So this is really helpful, um, especially in a sandbox environment. Of course, in an enterprise environment, another conversation, but definitely very helpful. Um, and that now we have this, this view, the session view that shows us different sessions. So destination, port, IP, um, country, uh, protocol, time. We have overall graphs, um, and then we can drill down and go to things like the SPI view. Um, so let's, let's just look at this traffic in a little bit more detail. Um, we can select a range uh, and say, you know, here we have a pattern. This is all traffic from malware. And so it's, it's unique in the sense that the vast majority of this is gonna be related to something malware was doing. Um, the spikes all seem kind of similar in pattern, right? Every sample I submit is going to run for three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 minutes. Um, and then it's going to stop and it's going to submit another sample. And so if I had to guess, I'd say that a lot of this is probably emotet, but then we have this spike that stands out, right? It looks abnormal. So I might drill into that and just see what we have in the session data. Maybe there's something there that's interesting. Maybe not. Um, the SPI view is also something to, to look at or investigate. Uh, because that takes really all of the different facets of the traffic and, and it breaks it down into ways that you can quickly see a summary of that data as well as, as, as pivot on it. Um, so for that period, this time period that we're looking at of traffic, uh, we can look at all of the, the DNS information. We can look at all of the HTTP. Um, it takes a little bit for this to load on my system. I maybe don't have as much horsepower there as I should, um, but it, it, uh, it helps for things or makes things stand out. And so this is another area that I'm oftentimes looking at to try to find interesting patterns. Um, one pattern I came across the other day uh, was that in my sandbox, I saw a, a DNS query for a TXT, a text record. I thought, well, that's odd because that doesn't happen too often, at least not at the stuff I look at. Um, I came across the query to inventivecyber.com. And when I looked at the response, uh, hopefully everyone can see this when it opens up. Uh, this was the response. So text records can have arbitrary content, um, but having arbitrary content that is an MSI exec command with a domain seemed very odd and that it was going to execute a, a family.png. So uh, that drew my attention to that analysis, that document. Um, I did end up eventually writing a whole blog post up about it because there were several things that were, were fairly unique to the doc that I thought were just really clever. I tend not to, if I think it's a red team tool, I tend not to, to do too much public with that because it's, it's a red team tool. Um, but in this case, I just couldn't quite tell. So I decided to, to post about it. Um, just two weeks ago, somebody DM'd me on Twitter and said, hey, by the way, this is uh, so-and-so. I wrote that doc. How the heck did you find it? Um, and it, it turns out they were doing some searching and came across it. And so um, they'd only used it for a, a single engagement and it did turn out to be a red team tool. At least that's what what I, I was told. <laughs> so it was very interesting. Um, I come across enough interesting stuff. Uh, oftentimes I'm, I'm trying to share that on social media. That's one of the primary reasons that I got active there. 
Um, I also have been long uh, creating and, and categorizing the, the interesting malware that I see. Uh, I used to do that in, in a standalone or a local WordPress site, you know, quick blog post to myself with some tags and, and uploaded the artifacts. But um, I thought, you know, why not provide back to the community? And so much like uh, I really was inspired by and have been by Brad Duncan and what he does at Malware Traffic Analysis, um, I just started uploading these samples to GitHub. And so there's something about every one of these samples that I think is interesting, whether it's just a, a family I haven't seen or it exhibits some pattern in the network traffic or, or some part of the other artifacts that it drops. Um, I, I've been posting uh, these samples here pretty regularly. So um, if, you, if you think it looks like malware traffic, it does. I didn't mean to rip him off. I just really like the format that he uses and I, and I thought this would be a valuable contribution instead of me just keeping it to myself. Um, so that's also there. Now, if we take a look then at some of the samples, let's actually jump to this one because we could analyze samples all night. Um, and I know I don't have all night to do that. Um, this is a doc that uh, I came across actually last night. I was looking at samples like any good presenter at about 12 a.m. No, trying sorry, to decide yeah. what I wanted to discuss and um, was looking at a few um, docs that I had recently mm. submitted. And um, this one uh, sort of stuck out to me. Uh, hold on one second here. Yeah, if you could please mute yourself. Yeah, somebody's loud. Like um, Herbert, if you could mute yourself, please. Uh, I got him. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so, uh, it's, just, it's distracting. It's like hearing yourself when you're talking. You get that feedback. You say something, and then you hear yourself a second later. It's just really, I can't mentally like fight through that. So, um, all right. So this document, like I said, I, I was just doing some, some you know, investigation through my, my sandbox here, trying to find something interesting to talk about today. And I, and I came across this, this particular doc. Um, you know, one of the first things that I always look at is the file type. The file type determines sort of where this fits in that MITRE attack matrix, that framework, and what kind of tools and what, what can I expect for behavior. Uh, this is a Word document. It has a relatively low score. And that means that it also is going to have, you know, a fairly sh small number of signatures. Um, looking at then uh, the behavioral analysis is another typically next step. Uh, what sort of processes did I see executed here? Uh, this, is, this is interesting, but only if you recognize that, that Cuckoo, there's a technique that, that especially Emotet's been using for a while for launching processes that, that Cuckoo just isn't, it isn't monitoring, it isn't tracing. Um, so on the surface, it might look interesting because we have word and no process activity, or it might look uninteresting. Um, but it's actually just a, a problem with Cuckoo that I haven't taken the time to, to fix or correct or dig into or offer some help with um, because I see that I know the pattern and I recognize it. Now, um, how do I further recognize that? Uh, well, if you look at the network analysis, you'll see that there was a Git request to tskgear.com, WP content uploads 2017 NBA. Uh, now, that's a domain, certainly, that Microsoft Word um, and Microsoft is not going to be making a request to. So that definitely seems like something that is a malicious aspect or potentially malicious, at least suspicious aspect of this document. If we expand the doc, uh, that request, we'll see, I guess it gets a, a little bit further suspicious in that we have the MZ header and the DOS stub. And so this was a PE file, an executable. So it looks like we, the, 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 you know, the office doc was able to download a PE file from this host and likely it executed it, yet we don't see any of that behavior. And we don't actually have any, any follow-on network activity that was recorded here. There's no more HTTP requests. There's, there's no more TCP sessions because this is from our, our tskgear.com. Um, we could look at IDS alerts. Right. And so here we have um, three alerts and all of these are geared towards alerting on that executable download. So it's all kind of telling us things that we already know, but only because we're doing this sort of more in-depth analysis of this particular uh, event. Um, if this were an IDS running in you know, an enterprise setting and these alerts came through, it might be something then that would draw your attention that you need to investigate. So we have some options. Um, we could definitely take 
our analysis here and um, we could extract that executable. We could get a hash, we have a file, we could run it through a sandbox, we could do some, some PE analysis. Um, we have some IOCs, we have at least this host, this domain that we suspect, we could take this data, try to figure out a little bit more about what's going on there. Um, maybe we wanna dig a little bit deeper and we wanna get into the macros themselves. And then that's the route that I wanna take here. So we can download the sample. Um, I've already done that and I've called this one um, maldoc3. And now we can use OLE dump. So OLE dump allows us to investigate the overall structure of our, of our office docs. Um, the long and short of OLE dump is that if we just provide a path to a file, then it tells us um, mainly the streams that contain macro content. So here we have 18 and 19 uppercase M indicates macro content. And then these are the names of those streams. So those are oftentimes obfuscated as, as part of the overall obfuscation of the document. Um, some things that are a little less obvious, uh, at least they, they've always been to me, it took me a really long time to figure this out, is that these streams here with the O's and the F's represent a user form and form objects. And where those typically play a role here with these maldocs is that they are user forms. So just think of your typical thick client application. There's a window, it's got buttons and labels. And then these, these objects then are used to store content shell code, PowerShell, strings, obfuscated content, whatever, whatever, whatever needs to be stored there. And so then what oftentimes will happen is in the macro code, they'll reference, so this is the name of our user form, the reference the form or properties or objects on that form to get that content. Um, and so that can just be helpful in understanding how those, those things are connected. Um, now this document has um, a user form, but the content really the, the size. So this, this column right here is the size of that particular stream. So with this user form, there are no streams here that have an abnormally large size. And I say that, let's take a look at another sample. So this is another doc, it's, these are Emotet. Um, this is another doc from a couple weeks ago. Let's just take a look at its overall structure. Okay, so here we can see um, obfuscated stream names for the macros, 18 and 19, same stream index, which is just, I guess, their thing, um, contains macro code, user form objects, but now we have this one stream that contains quite a bit of content, right? And so this is definitely a deviation. Um, now, I didn't recognize this right away. Uh, I got into analyzing the macro code before I recognized what was different here. So if we go back to the original document, the one that started this whole, let's call it an, our investigation, um, then what we can do is we can dump the macro content. So we identify the stream, 18, and then we tell OLE dump to decompress. So dash S and then the stream index and then dash V for the macros. We only use dash V with macro code run that and that'll dump the content out here to the terminal. So we probably wanna redirect that to a file or something. I've already done that just to, to, to speed things up. Um, and here you can see that this one macro stream has document open. So that's the entry point. This is what's going to execute when the document is open and contents enabled. Um, and it's simply gonna call this function inside of this stream. And you'll notice uh, J-Y-O-N, first four characters, that is the name of the macros from stream 19. Right? So that's just how that, that's how we can see the code jumping to different streams. Um, let's extract 19 then. Uh, I'm just going to use Visual Studio Code uh, because it has the ability to get syntax highlighting for Visual Basic, which is essentially what we're looking at. Um, and then that just helps me to visually parse everything. So here we have, um, this, this mini, the mini view, the mini bar to the side, um, as well as then the code. And that color coding can actually help me and help you to understand sort of the obfuscation. That's, that's generally what we're dealing with then now at this stage is, is how do we unravel what this macro code is doing? Well, we have to figure out the obfuscation. Um, you, you'll notice patterns uh, and particularly, um, you know, you know, different groups will use sort of different obfuscation techniques that, that you can recognize pretty quickly once you get used to looking at them. Um, here's an example. If you take a look at this variable, um, very first one, and it is equal to the 
the results of all of these, these operations that seem very random and, and kind of nonsensical. You'll notice that if you highlight that variable, it's used again, but in the exact same expression, right? So whatever value it held here, it's never used, it's reassigned. Um, if we scroll down a bit, we'll see that pattern repeats over and over and over. You'll notice then that there are a number, uh, there are a number of statements that really follow that same pattern. And so now all of a sudden we've been able to identify probably, you know, 90% of this code in this particular case is all just junk and we can either visually just filter it out. Or if we were really going to have to spend some time in this document, we could go ahead and, and we could start to refactor it, maybe clean it up a bit. Uh, but we're not going to do that here. Um, what else can we do? Well, I like to look at the thumbnail view over here, right? At this level, looking for um, strings is, is very important because the strings then are what are going to be obfuscated. So they'll be deobfuscated and eventually they'll become our JavaScript or our PowerShell or whatever our, our objects that need to be created. This is a big string, right? And that sort of, uh, oh gosh, I don't know what color I would call that kind of looks orangey to me, um, that kind of stands out here in the, this view. And so it can help to, to focus in on that. Um, if you look at the string, all right, if you actually just start highlighting, you'll notice that as you highlight, uh, you'll see that that pattern is repeating over and over and over. And in fact, you get all the way to where it would almost overlap and there's only a few characters left. So W-I-N-M-G-M-T, uh, it's WinMGT, it's WMI, right? So now we know that we're onto something. We kind of have some sense of, of the obfuscation, at least in the strings that it's using. And so that can be very helpful. Uh, we can now, you know, start to trace those variables later on in the, you know, in the macros to try to understand and try to unravel this and not have to go through every single line of code. Um, now with these, right, if we know that the strings have this pattern in them, the, the, this, this pattern has to be removed or replaced. So I start looking for functions that would do that. Uh, replace comes to mind, right, but replace is not found here. Um, after spending just a little bit of time analyzing it, it comes, turns out that split and, and how splits being used is here you can see our obfuscation pattern and uh, share the hash of this file. Oh yeah, sure. Um, I actually posted this on Twitter today too. <laughs> Josh, it uh, looks like Joseph has a question as well. Uh, do you ever worry about samples evading slash rejecting your sandboxes and has it happened often with Cuckoo or no? Oh, I'm not scared. I'm not scared. Um, yeah, I, I am, um, definitely. Um, I try to keep my systems uh, isolated. So typically my, my cuckoo lives in, uh, you know, an isolated network and, um, I'm just prepared that if anything does escape, um, it's, I, I don't know <laughs> how I would observe it. Uh, I do run an IDS on the traffic that goes out of that network. Um, so hopefully I would, I would catch it or be able to, to somehow recognize it. Um, but, uh, that's, probably the biggest thing I do. Um, outside of that, um, you know, because there's no other systems in that network, I'm not too worried. I mean, they'd, they'd have to, to compromise the Linux host and then you know, they just know where else to go from there. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I worry about it and I, I try the best I can to limit that. Um, but it doesn't stop me from, from doing, from running the environment. All right. Thank you. And, and then how about not even running? I mean, how many samples do you come across that now detect they're in some form of sandbox oh, sure. VM, then they just, they just don't run. Yeah, a lot. Um, uh, so hardening a VM and, and trying to make it harder to detect is something that I'm constantly experimenting with. Uh, for some reason, when I set up my Cuckoo Sandbox initially, I skipped using VM Cloak. VM Cloak is developed by Jurian, who is, is one of the core Cuckoo developers. And it goes through and it helps to remove some of those artifacts that are present that that you know malware can detect. Um, so I've been redoing all of them. Um, I've gone in and I've tried to make them as realistic as possible. Uh, you know, CPUs and you know, a couple CPU virtual CPUs and more memory and larger hard drives. Um, but it's still there's still things that they detect on. So um, I find a lot of samples just are you know they're they're not detonating in in Cuckoo just stock Cuckoo as I'd like. So um, that's where sometimes I have to go to the other online sandboxes because I just haven't had the time to really commit to fully developing it. Um, but 
because I, I, you know, I have to worry about analyzing things in, 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 in a massive quantity, uh, it works out okay for me. Uh, but definitely it, it is something that, that requires pretty constant attention. And, and I think uh, to me, it feels like over even the last year, I, I've had you know, more issues with samples detecting something in the environment. And I just don't, like I said, I just always have the time to figure out what it is and, and move on. So. Great, thank uh, you for your answer. Well, most of the time they run, sometimes they don't run too. <laughs> but for the most part, once the environment's up and stable, it's more of an anti-analysis thing. Um, yeah, great question. So yeah, VM cloak. Um, and it's it's you know something that hasn't been updated in a while too. So you'll probably find there'll be some 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 definitely some nuances working with it. But um, I've got some VMs up and running with it, and I'm just moving into that phase where I'm going to start testing and comparing to my normal, my primary cuckoo, and just see what the differences are. See if I have any success, and um, likely I'll, I'll put some you know my results out somewhere, a blog post or something when I when I get there. Um, okay, uh, to keep things moving then. Um, so this sample here, uh, so split right, so split. There's our, our string pattern. We could have just searched on that as well. Um, that brings us to um, what we're splitting on. So this variable right here then has to be the content that we're splitting. As you highlight that, you can see that it's assigned the value from this function, the statement right here. And so if we look at that variable, we can see that this is the argument to this function call. So, so we're using these sort of these key things, right? Object creation or certain function calls or certain events to try to puzzle this out. Um, from here, if we just go ahead and grab, uh, let's just search for it. Oh, come on. We'll see there's four references. There's a couple places where it's called and then of course where it's defined. Um, so if we go to, uh, the last instance, right, we know that then this argument has to be some content that's being deobfuscated, at least in part. This is the value, the variable that's passed to that function. And we can see that this is assigned the content from inline shapes dot alternative text. Um, now, this is what I came across, and I don't know how recent this change occurred, but this is the first time that I've observed it um, in these Emotet docs, uh, and that this content is, is coming from the alternative text, the alternate text of an image, uh, an image that is defined as an inline image. Um, if we look at the old macros, so this is from that older document that I mentioned, you'll see that it has a different obfuscation pattern but a lot of it is very similar. There's a lot of junk code in here that just really doesn't do anything. Um, then we have this large string here, and this string has a very similar pattern. And if we just go down to the end, we'll probably find where this content is coming from the control tip text from a tab from our user form. And that actually then is where, when we looked at the macro content from those two documents, Right? That's where this, this is a much larger stream because that, that PowerShell is actually stored here in that user form. So we can, we can, ex oops, we can extract that. Oh, no, I can't type. So let's look at the old document first, the older document. Um, stream uh, 17. 17. And here you go. Right. There we can see the pattern. So we know that's where our content's located. Um, the default is this hex view. If we want to extract that content, we don't want the hex view. So we can say dash D, that'll just give us a raw dump. We can now take this, you know, redirect it to a file, remove the pattern, and we'll have our base 64. Uh, so I guess we could do that real quick. Um, 64, 3. I'll just open that with Visual Studio. Visual Studio is going to complain because there's some binary content in there because we've gotten all of the content, not just what was stored in that tooltip, but also information about those objects in that form. And since Visual Studio is not really a, a, a hex editor, uh, we just have to tell it to open anyway. And then we can just remove the leading and the trailing um, content that's unnecessary. Uh, this is base 64, or we at least suspect that it is. And so it makes sense that we would end on an equal sign just because that is, is very common because of the block encoding that it uses to have an equal sign or two at the end. And if we suspect this to be PowerShell, then it would make sense that the first character would be a P. Uh, much like the previous example, we can just 
highlight until we either um, merge on another repeating pattern or uh, PO for PowerShell. And that looks like that is our pattern. So we just copy that, uh, do a replace. And there we go, there's our PowerShell. Uh, PowerShell tech E, so base64 payload. So this will then execute, decode this and execute it as, as PowerShell. Um, so from here, I love using CyberChef. CyberChef, if you're, if you're not familiar, is a tool from GCHQ, another government intelligence service from the UK or, or at least the, the British. And it allows you to take all of these different, this, all this different functionality, uh, create these recipes, and then it just works on your input, producing output, and then working with the next one. So uh, for example, if I want to decode base64 decode, I just paste that payload in, I tell it to base64 decode, and now we get the output. Um, you can see that we've got some extra characters here. Uh, that tends to be because the base64 encoded content is actually UTF-16. So then we can add another uh, formula here and we could tell it to decode that in, from UTF-16. And uh, what we should have saw is, um, oh yeah, that's right. Um, the content now uh, without all those extra characters. And, and so then, oh, I think I got maybe two payloads in here. Let's do this. I'm just going to paste that in again. Yeah, okay. Um, and now we have just the PowerShell. Uh, even though it doesn't really look like PowerShell, it's still obfuscated. And, and so it's just a matter of, of sort of cleaning that up. Um, for the sake of time, I already did that. Uh, and these are the kind of results that you get and that you get a lot of domains here. Um, maybe the original one that you saw when that Trojan was first dropped, but if it doesn't or it's not able to connect and it rolls on to the next one and then the next one and then the next one. Um, and so you put it in a sandbox and if this host is still active, if it still has the Trojan, it drops it, it checks right here for the length. It looks like it's valid. It tries to execute it and it stops. If it can't connect, it goes to the next one. And so if we, we can force our sandboxes um, to not connect and it will then resolve through all of the different DNS queries. Uh, we can go grab these payloads. Uh, we can certainly submit them to places like URL house. We can analyze the resulting PE files. Um, there's a lot we can do from here. And this can be valuable, right? This is just Emotet. This is a pattern that Emotet has been using for, for, for quite a while now. Uh, but there is oftentimes value in being able to at times dig into these macro documents. Now, um, I kind of jumped into this new one. Um, if you, yeah, Emotet, I know. Uh, if we go back to this one, well, what about this alternative text and why did I make such a fuss over it? Uh, well, it's a minor change, uh, but the reason that it is still significant uh, is that if we look at that document, as you saw originally, the content doesn't show up in the user form because it's not stored there. Um, and so you can extract it, at least I don't know how to extract it with a tool like OLE dump and um, even running strings with that previous document, we could just run strings. We could extract that base64 payload. We could find the token. We could programmatically parse it out, get the domains and, and be happy. Um, but even with strings now, however, that content is being stored, I'm just not seeing it. And it could be, there could be an obvious answer. Uh, but with just the time of coming across this last night, I haven't been able to dig too deep into it. Um, the content is stored right here. So here is our social engineering image. Uh, if we right click on that format picture, alt text, right? There's our, there's our PowerShell. So there is that content that, and how it's being stored. And so even, even a very small change in their tactics can have a pretty significant impact on our tools and our workflows and, and how we identify where this content is stored, especially if we're trying to automate the extraction of this content. Um, so just something, again, uh, interesting that, that I came across the other night. Um, how are we doing on time? We've still got time, Mike, you want me to keep going? Yep, plenty of time. Plenty of time, okay. Okay, some other areas that we could have looked at, um, of course, the URL house, uh, searching for that domain. You can see at this point in time, there's been other uh, Directories that were used to drop the payload, a uh, very common technique with Emotet uh, for once they compromise a legitimate website, even if it's a small website, there's you know two or three or four places that they're delivering their payloads from. And 
what's great about this service is not only could we take the domain and come here and search for it and get results, hopefully, we can see the tags. This could help us identify that it's Emotet, and, and if we care, maybe what epoch. Um, we could also take the hash from the file. So we could have grabbed the executable that was downloaded here, and we I guess it's just not keeping up with me. Um, we could have grabbed that executable, extracted it either from the PCAP or, or maybe it's in Moloch, um, and we could have searched for the hash as well. And so searching for the hash, um, if it was correlated to this domain, then those results would come up. And so we can, we can really go both ways. And that's also, again, very, very helpful. Um, Cryptolamus is a very prevalent group of researchers that are you know, dedicated to exposing all things Emotet. They have um, their daily pay stumps. They put a lot of information out on Twitter. A lot of this data is included in you know, IDS rule sets. And then of course, um, with URL house or abuse.ch, they provide some, uh, some IDS rule sets. And so this can be another place to come and search. And here you can see that TSK gear is uh, of course identified as one of those hosts that are dropping these malicious documents. And so this is another way in which we can just go and, and use these open source threat research you know, groups and their activity and all the great work that they're doing in order to get information and help with our analysis. Okay, um, any questions so far? I slowly slouch as I sit and talk. <laughs> Some lag, okay. Anybody else having any lag? Hopefully it's good here. It seems good on my end. Yeah, I can't say that I am on my end. Everything seems to be flowing fairly smoothly. Uh, we did have a question come up a little earlier uh, about uh, seeing Ghidra. Oh yeah. Um, what do I think of Ghidra? I think that was the question. Yep, yeah, comparing um, it with ID IDA Pro. Yeah, so let's let's work to that right now. Um, we'll just jump to another sample here. This one's a little bit older, but um, I just think it does some really cool things that, that are worth knowing and understanding. And it'll it'll actually take us into to working with Ghidra a little bit. Um, so yeah, let's go there right now. Um, okay, so here, uh, oh, and of course, you know, here's the maldoc from earlier. This is uh, this is analysis on any run, and I, I do want to point this out because you know, something that we're always looking for as, you know, security folks is to, to, is to try to find a quicker, more effective way. Um, we run this document in a sandbox. It does all the work of, of unraveling those macros. Here is the PowerShell command. We select the PowerShell, we select more info. There's the base 64. All right, and we didn't have to go through all the work that we did. Um, although, Again, it's, it's good to have the ability to do that, to observe changes in TTPs, to understand, um, if there's enough, enough additional behavior, Emotet, for whatever reason, they just don't do a lot in their macros. Um, they don't do any anti-analysis, at least I haven't seen anything in quite some time. It's, it's usually fairly straightforward. Um, obfuscation that is very repetitive. It's WMI to start a process to launch PowerShell. It's base64. The only thing I've seen change really over the last year is how they've been padding that base64 encoded payload. That's the only thing that's changed over the last 12 months or so that I've been you know, kind of casually looking at all those maldocs. Um, what automation had I been able to work into my methodology? Um, well, some of the automation is, uh, I think, centered around, around Cuckoo, as I mentioned. Um, I have some scripts that are running uh, that are, you know, downloading samples from places like Hybrid Analysis. I can get a, a couple hundred samples. I think they're a day as a free user. Um, certainly a, a URL house um, scraping directly from URLs that are submitted, as well as um, the payloads that they have collected um, and integrating those into Cuckoo. Uh, now, for me, w the research I do sort of as an independent person is just you know, I look for those interesting things. So then I, I could check my sandbox. Um, I can see if there's anything that stands out. I can look at Moloch, see if anything that stands out, um, and then do some analysis there. Uh, if I have a sample that I'm, I'm curious uh, about, let's say, um, you know, fill in, fill in good one. Uh, this got a score out of zero. So this is a, a good doc, right? Um, probably not. But what it, what it likely means is that there was no behavioral, there was no network. Um, and so then oftentimes what I do is I uh, just take that hash and I go to the URL house or the malware bazaar. 
um, and see what they have to say about it. And if I can find any data here that could tell me what it is. Uh, okay, so this looks like it came from not a fade dot top and it's red line stealer. All right, and so that's, that's not really automation, but that's kind of the flow that I have because I'm doing a lot of just sort of one-off analysis. Um, my goal is, is to automate a lot more of this, to have a workflow that integrates all of these, this, this, you know, the different platforms like you see here uh, to help with tagging and, and classification and, and getting it more, a little bit more centralized than what I have. Uh, but right now I just haven't seemed to be able to, to find quite the time to do that. Um, I have some other processes that are, are running to help like discover malware, um, open directories has been something I've been really interested in. Um, and so I, I have some, some tools in place to, to scrape for those, um, look for particularly open directories. Um, and, and then if there's, you know, archives or something there to get some insight into the tooling. Um, so that's another thing I've been trying to, to work on automating. Yeah, it sounds like a grad. Uh, yeah, you know, um, it, it is a project for a grad student and, and I've got a grad student doing some projects right now. <laughs> so uh, I hope to have some, some cool tools that I'd like to share with the community here in the next few months. Um, so yeah, not as much automation as I'd like, but uh, slowly work in there. Um, Okay, so to, to move to the next doc, uh, this one here is um, one that performs process hollowing. And uh, uh, again, we won't have the time to get into all the aspects of it, but uh, hopefully you, you get the, uh, the idea of what's happening in the document and the significance of it. And then that'll allow us to segue right into, a, uh, to move right into Ghidra. Um, this document, you can see uh, this was, it's Word, which launches explorer.exe. All right, and, and anytime a legitimate executable from the system is launched, it's, it's suspicious, I'm suspicious of process hollowing. Um, this document I have in Cuckoo as well. Uh, let's go back to my recent, there's the same document. It's scored a 7.6, again, somewhat subjective, somewhat relative. Um, but what we can see is if we look at Word, um, Word in this case launched SVC host, and it did that out of Syswa 64. So that gives us some insight that maybe it's having some, some logic in there that differentiates between architecture 32 versus 64 bit. Maybe that has an impact on its behavior or not. It's hard to say without maybe digging in and understanding a bit more. Um, we can also look at Word. Word is responsible for launching SVC host and we can filter based off of function calls. So um, if we wanna look at say the process events and we wanna specifically look for create process, we can see that here was the function call to create the process. Here's SVC host and here's the creation flags. So create suspended means that the process was loaded from disk into memory it's ready for execution, but it wasn't executed. And, and this is a very common approach for process hollowing. And that now once our code has a handle to that process, it can go ahead and it can hollow out the code. It can replace it with something malicious or unintended and then execute that. And in the meantime, it looks like our process is, you know, loaded from a legitimate system location. Although seeing SVC host running under Word is also very abnormal, very uncommon, um, and would be definitely suspicious. Um, from there, we see some memory allocations, um, execute read write, so executable code. And we start thinking, all right, how do I get this shell code out in order to understand maybe what's going on here? Um, this takes us then to the document. Uh, the document using OLE dump, extract the macros. And again, I've already done that just to help with our, with our uh, analysis here. And what's interesting about this um, that I, I don't see as often as I used to, but certainly I see it fairly regular, uh, is that we can interface in the macros directly with the Windows API. So if there isn't functionality that you want from Visual Basic, then just interface with the Windows API and there you go. So it's a very powerful feature and, and it's one of those features, I guess you call it a feature, uh, that when I first saw it, I thought, really, <laughs> we could do Windows API stuff directly in the macros? That's crazy. Um, so here we have a number of APIs, uh, virtual alloc, memory allocation, uh, move memory, so copying things in from one location to another, um, and then some other functions that may or may not have anything to do with the execution of shellcode. 
Um, so if we think about this document trying to stage shell code, then it would make sense that it would try to allocate memory using something like virtual alloc, that it would try to copy something into that memory, and then it needs to execute that. And how would it do that? Um, well, some things you can do is you may find an API here, a function that you just, it, it's the one, you just know it is. Um, if you don't, then you can start looking. All of these functions are, are essentially aliased. So enum date formats W is alias with, uh, I've always pronounced that as cabriolet. So I'm gonna continue to say it like that. And so now we can highlight that, copy and do a find. And, and if they show up, we know it's being used. If they don't show up, it's not being used. And this is actually a function that is being used in another stream. So over here in stream mate. Uh, what is enum date formats? Seems like an odd function to call. And if we consult the documentation on MSDN, so just do a search MSDN EDUM date formats, and you'll find that the first argument is a pointer to an application defined callback function. So a pointer to a function. So it makes sense. It doesn't have anything to do with dates. It just needs something that will call the recently allocated shell code, the recently allocated memory for us. So if we go back and take a look then, this is the address that's going to be called. And you can do a little bit of tracing here. If you look at this variable, APRUM, this is assigned Bayberry plus Anklet. If we look at Bayberry, Bayberry is assigned a return value from calling this function, right? And then Anklet is assigned, there's two locations, and there's, again, some conditional logic. If it's Windows 64, go this route. If it's Windows 32, go this route. So I would suspect then that this is going to be the base of the memory allocation for calling something like virtual alloc. And then this is likely going to be some offset to define the entry point. Um, with the process hollowing from Cuckoo and, and the original analysis I did, I used the 32-bit platform. And so if we add all of these up, right, 22 plus 484 plus 3171, Oops, I meant to do that in base 10. So let's do that over again. Ah. Okay, now switch this over to hex. Um, E5D, that's, that's our offset. So we have the base of the allocation is whatever it is. And then the entry point is actually at an offset of plus E5D and hex um, from the base of that, that allocation. So if we want to analyze the shell code, we have to get the shell code out of memory. And again, there's a number of ways you could do this. Um, you could continue to figure out, trace maybe back in the macros to see where that shell code's stored. Likely it's in a user form object somewhere. Maybe it's obfuscated, maybe it's not. Um, you might approach it using dynamic analysis and the office suite, the IDE to develop macros is something that actually works quite nicely. Um, this isn't of course the same document, but if you open up the developer mode, Visual Basic, um, then you can go into your docs and you can open up the macros and you can set breakpoints. And so now you can step through those. And so I use the IDE actually quite a bit when I want to step through macro code because it's, it's quicker to do analysis. It may be quicker to unravel something that's obfuscated. There's just any number of, of reasons why I might use it. Um, so in that case, we set a breakpoint here. Uh, we run it until we hit this breakpoint. We can see what the value is in this variable. We can open up a tool like Process Hacker. It'll show us then the, um, the memory and we can save it. We can extract that. Uh, and that's, that's the approach that I took here. Uh, that content then, so I'm gonna go to where I saved that, that's binary content. And what we can do with that is we can open it up in Ghidra. I'll just try to declutter just a little bit here. Um, So with Ghidra, uh, it's already installed. This is the latest version of Remnix, Remnix V7, um, which was just released here in the last few weeks. Um, so Ghidra comes uh, set up and installed. You can just go to activities, uh, type in um, Ghidra, and you should get the little dragon icon and, and that'll launch that. 
And once you launch Ghidra, then what you have to do is you have to decide on a project. You have to create a project. And, and one of the things I really like about Ghidra, there's a number of things, but this is one of the things I really like is that it has this, this project concept that allows you to associate you know, things you want to analyze that are related. Um, it also has the shared versus non-shared project. And so the shared version is essentially creating a repository that other analysts can then check you know, code, check projects in and out of, and so that you can share it in a sense. Uh, for standalone work though, we don't need that. We'll create a non-shared project. I'm just gonna call this uh, demo two because you saw I already had demo. Um, and then now that we have that project created, we can add whatever we wanna analyze to it. So let's drag and drop our shell code into our project. Uh, this is very similar to IDA. IDA is, uh, we take whatever we want to analyze, we open it with IDA or we drop it onto the IDA icon. Um, it's going to then do file detection. It's going to try to detect the file format. Is it a PE file? Is it a MACO? Is it whatever, whatever formats that it supports um, so that it can understand how to disassemble and analyze it for us. Uh, Ghidra is doing the same thing here, except that with shell code, we don't have a, a binary file format that it's stored in. It's not in a PE file format. It's just raw binary content that's going to be shoved into memory and executed. So it does accurately detect this as raw binary, but we can't go any further until we tell it what is the underlying architecture. So we can filter for x86, 32-bit Visual Studio. It was going to run in Windows and then select OK. Right. And now we're ready to move on. Um, typically here, Ida will go ahead and it'll do the disassembly. What Ghidra does though, is it imports, but it doesn't done any additional uh, disassembly or program analysis. So we get a successful import, but in order to do the disassembly, we need to take this and drag it into our tool chest onto the code browser, or you could just double click it. This will launch Ghidra. It'll ask you if the program has not been analyzed before, if you want to analyze it. And in this case, yes, we do. Um, actually, you know what? Well, we don't have to because we know the entry point. So we'll do the analysis. We'll prompt it manually. Uh, but in most cases, you do want to do the analysis. And um, uh, you have a lot of options here. We won't have time to go through them all. Fortunately, most of them have a description and or sub options. So you can kind of explore those. Um, in a lot of cases, it's safe to accept the default unless you know or have a reason to, to deviate from those. Um, once we get into Ghidra, right, now we have two main windows here. We have the listing view, which is where our disassembly will reside. We have the decompiler, which will be then a, a kind of a pseudo C representation of that, that disassembly. So it helps in a lot of cases to make, you know, the analysis of the program go a little bit smoother. Um, other information here, uh, imports, exports, functions, the overall structure of the program, the program tree, data types. Um, a lot of this is very similar to what you'd see in, in Ghidra and other reverse engineering platforms. Uh, as I said, though, we need to do, prompt it to do the disassembly. Um, so we have the beginning of the file. Now, most of the time, this is going to represent a virtual address. So the program is going to disassemble and it's going to try to, to map it like it would be into, into virtual memory when it's being executed. But with a raw binary file, the shell code, since it doesn't have any of that information, it just opens up the file, gets you a offset of zero. So we just go to E5D, which is already identified as a function. So now we can select that. Um, you can see that we have not only, let's scroll down a little bit further here. Uh, we have the beginning of the disassembly. We also have the results from the decompiler. A um, lot of features here that you could start exploring. Um, one thing that I like is uh, that not only do you have the decompiler, uh, but it it's, it's coordinates the views. So when you select something in the decompiler, you'll see the equivalent instruction or instructions highlighted typically in this listing view. Um, I, use, I use both still, right? I, I find that the, the decompiler has some flaws. There's just some inaccurate analysis that I've encountered from time to time. And so being able to kind of compare that, what I see in the decompiler with what I see in the disassembly output has, has still been pretty helpful. Um, there's a, a graph view. So we can open up a graph view. This is sort of the default view that you get with IDA. Um, I, I think it's a little bit better integrated with IDA that, or I'm just so used to working with IDA that it's, it's kind of become one of my crutches. Um, but it certainly works the same. You can zoom in, you can zoom out, uh, you can quickly navigate to different 
um, different sections. My VM's a little laggy here. Um, to try to identify sort of the, the bigger patterns and the flow of the program. You know, for example, we can see some paths that branch up here very early on and look like, I don't know, there's maybe a looping structure here. Uh, but then as we move down maybe to this location, we can see, you know, something that maybe terminates versus some additional logic. And so these can be helpful in trying to recognize areas of the code that we want to analyze, especially if we don't have any other indicators to help us. If we don't have a, a function or we don't have a string or, or something that, that would draw us to a, a particular area. Um, from here, it's, it's really analyzing the code, analyzing, in this case, the shell code. And if you're not familiar with analyzing shell code, there's just a ton of nuances that go into it. Uh, you know, certainly one of the challenges with, with all of, of reverse engineering, whether it's for exploit development or vulnerability analysis or um, malware analysis, is that we're, we're oftentimes looking at the, you know, looking at the end product of something that's been compiled or obfuscated, and we have to to unravel that. And so it just by nature makes it more challenging. Um, in addition to that, you know, we're going to be dealing with undocumented things. Um, you know, some of you may recognize this move EAX FS30 hex. Uh, that's a pointer to the PEB, the process environment block, which with these other instructions allow the code to get the base of NTDLL. From there, it can reconstruct an import table. Because remember, this is shell code. It got shoved into memory, and it doesn't go through the normal process of loading like, a, like an executable does. So any functions it wants to call, it has to resolve on its own. Or if somebody's just trying to make it really hard to trace the program flow, they'll dynamically construct their import table. Um, and so, you know, being able to recognize and trace this, then it, it becomes really the sort of the crux of this sort of analysis activity. So... Uh, all in all, I'd say Ghidra is is definitely, um, I think I saw SANS is moving towards a lot of Ghidra in their courses, especially their RE courses. Um, you know, definitely seeing a lot more, you know, just support from it, for it around in the community. Um, it has a lot of very comparable features. A lot of the plugins that uh, you might be used to in IDA are, are being ported over to Ghidra. Um, it has a plugin framework, much like IDA Pro. And, uh, and it seems to be going to, you know, uh, continue to go um, ongoing support through the, the NSA, the National Security, Security Agency. So um, there, there is an awful lot to like about it. Uh, from a teaching perspective, I love it because it's free. <laughs> I don't have to worry about licenses. I don't have to worry about making anyone upset because a student stole an installer or something. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it's quite capable. So um, all in all, I use, still use both of them quite regularly, but I'm, I'm finding that I am adopting more and more of my workflow to, to Ghidra. Okay, questions so far? Uh, fire, yeah, I haven't used uh, Speakeasy. Um, so that would be interesting to, to do uh, and get some hands on there. Okay, so um, a lot of things we could talk about here, uh, even in this, this, this shell code. Um, you know, uh, simple things uh, here are, you know, strings and APIs. Those are typically two of the most important things to identify when reversing anything. Strings become values for argu arguments for functions. They become functions that become names of imports. They become our obfuscated, deobfuscated PowerShell. Uh, this particular document, uh, or this particular shell code is using stack strings. It's an old thing. It's been around forever. There's, there's tools from, from FireEye uh, that can help you to, to identify these stack strings and extract them. Normal strings utility doesn't. You can convert them. So here we can change that from its hex representation to ASCII. And we can then reveal what those strings are. And by doing that, that helps us to understand more about this area of functionality. Uh, another thing that we can do is um, if we scroll down just a little bit, um, <laughs> like here, right? On occasion, um, you might be able to uh, identify signatures essentially on your own. Um, in this case, we suspect the shell code of, of being responsible for the process hollowing. Um, and this pattern, 
So we can't see the function because that's being dynamically resolved based off of the techniques I briefly discussed just a few minutes ago. Um, so something resolved, a call to create process, it's stored it in a local variable relative to our, or on our stack, stack frame. Um, this call then is dereferencing that local variable and then calling that. And so we can see all these pushes are a part of the arguments for this function call. Uh, now, the one that stands out here is this push hex four. That is the creation or that is the flag to create the process in a suspended state. Um, and so knowing that, if we now look at the graph view, um, that is this location right here. I'll try to zoom in. Oh gosh, it's really slow. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see that. There's a hex four. So there's the same location. I thought it would synchronize. Maybe it just hadn't caught up or something. Um, but now if all we were interested in is what happens after the process hollowing, um, you know, now we could just focus on this series of, of, of code, this, this flow of the program from here. And we could maybe bypass all the rest of that stuff or, or only go back if we really needed to. So little things like that can, can really go a long way, but identifying those strings, identifying those function calls, those are usually the first thing I try to identify when in doing this sort of low, low, lower level analysis. Um, and like I said, there's a lot we could discuss here, but uh, hopefully this, this gives you a, a good sense. Um, if we take a look then at um, a couple of other payloads. So um, I think I probably will take the full two hours, huh? Um, just go talk, for, I'll just talk for another five or 10 minutes. Um, this, uh, there's a couple of other payloads. So, let, so let's say instead of analyzing um, the, the maldocs or the shell code, we want to analyze one of those executables that are dropped. Um, so here I have two, uh, PWINI, uh, rest of that there, and then this Loki bot sample. Um, the file type, of course, is, is very important. So if we look at the file type of the first executable, we'll see that, that not only is it a PE file, but that it is also um, a, a mono.NET assembly. And, and that's great because what that tells us then is that we can decompile it using a .NET decompiler like .peak or dnspy instead of using a tool like IDA. Uh, you could try to disassemble it with IDA and I think IDA will disassemble it, um, but you're not looking at any of the bytecode. You're looking at whatever the compiler added in order to get the code ready for execution. Um, we can use a tool like PE Studio um, that's not the right file now, so let's do this. And so it can still tell us important things about the file, the PE file, resources, it can give us strings, it can give us, um, if we have the virus total, uh, results from virus total. Um, but it's also going to tell us that we're dealing with a .NET assembly. And so typically with .NET, it has one import, that's MS core library, it has one function that it calls, that's this core XE main, um, and then it's up to the runtime to execute that, that shell code. Um, with this tool, or with that file type, we could go and use something like dnspy. Um, dnspy is, I guess, the, 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 the .NET decompiler that, uh, that I go to most often. And we can take this file, we can add it to dnspy, and now it'll go ahead and decompile that program for us. Um, so here we can see that we have C-sharp representation of this program. Uh, that doesn't mean it's always gonna be easy. Um, I'm trying to remember where this starts. Typically we wanna find the entry point. So I found it here in Mario Objects. This appears to be masquerading as a Super Mario Brothers game. Um, so in Mario objects program main, and then from here, it just instantiates a new instance of a form. Uh, and it's these, these, some events tied to this form creation where this actually exists. So now we have to go and look at the, um, Oh, I forgot where it's located. Oh, right here. Okay, so eventually we, we get to a point where 
um, we see that it's, it's doing this. I'm gonna try to zoom this in. Okay, hopefully that, can you, everyone see that okay? Yeah, that's better, thanks. Okay. That looks good. Good, okay, I can zoom it in a little bit more. Oh, uh, shoot. Tools, options, 16. Ah, come on. Okay, there we go. All right. Well, eventually, we, we eventually trace to a point where it starts to do things that look a little abnormal. And this is definitely a place where things start to look a little bit abnormal. Um, we have a string replace. So we're, we're replacing the string Delphine with the triple A's. Um, this comes from a resource that's then reversed, that's then decoded, that's loaded into a byte array. Uh, that byte array then is invoked as an assembly and it calls the start game method, right? And so, where do we find that string? Well, we can find that string by looking at the resources and there's our string one. Here is the string, okay? So if we grab all of this content and let's just jump over to CyberChef. All right, we can paste that in. Uh, we can do a replace here before we decode. Hopefully this will work. Delphine and AAA. Uh, we also need to do a reverse. So we'll do that after the replace. Uh, simple string. There we go. Um, doesn't look quite right. But uh, anyways, um, you get the idea that uh, this is in fact an executable. So it would make sense in the context of, of the program that we were analyzing that it replaced characters, it reversed it, it decoded it, and then it, it based off that byte array, dynamically executed it. Um, and so that takes us to the next stage. Uh, the next stage with this one um, is this, uh, this DLL that you extracted. So just taking um, Cyber Chef, we can save it. I, I think this isn't quite right, but I'm not gonna troubleshoot it right now just for time. So let's just pretend I got it right. Uh, we'd save this content and then we could analyze it. We would find that it is a DLL, it was loaded as a .NET assembly, and we can use DNSpy in order to analyze that. Um, with the first attempt, so we get that first DLL extracted, uh, what happens is that it is going to be obfuscated. And so there are tools to help with that. Uh, Sparta, start game. And there's the DE4 dot, which is a utility provided to help with identifying and defeating .NET obfuscation. So here you can see, um, this is intermediate language IL, it's the bytecode. It's like a kind of a high level assembly if there is such a thing. Um, and so it's just gonna be, it's gonna be harder to read and understand. There's still gonna be some obfuscation in it. And after running it through the DE4 dot, then it deobfuscates that for us. Um, again, that's a pretty straightforward tool to run. You just provide the input, the file that you wanna to try to deobfuscate. Uh, now the results of that, you can see look quite a bit better. Um, and that um, it looks like the analysis here is a bit more straightforward. Uh, what drew me to this originally was I found you know, like five or six samples sitting on an open directory one day. Um, I put them all in a sandbox. They all timed out um, and with some of the online sandboxes. So with Cuckoo immediately it stopped. It didn't, I didn't no go there. Um, with any run, um, all of them but one timed out. So I thought, well, let's just take a look and see what we can see. Um, the first thing it does is a long sleep. I think that's 10 minutes if I remember correctly. Um, the next thing it does then after it sleeps is it extracts another payload. And, and this is, I thought, kind of an interesting thing because I, I don't run across this too often. Um, but it has these functions that aren't all that obfuscated right here and that it has this XOR decrypt and then it has this decompress method. And what it ends up doing is back from the original resource of the PE file. Because remember, these are all running in context of that original file. Um, it has this image. And so it actually used some Stego in order to read each pixel value, extract the content from it, 
uh, XOR decode it and decompress it. And then it, it, that results in the next stage of the payload, another PE file, um, which then is also obfuscated and, and it takes some more analysis. Um, so I thought that was kind of a, a fun one. Um, the last sample that we'll look at was just uh, real quick, a Loki bot from earlier this year. Uh, this one also will highlight why you know, every tool that you use can be very valuable. So this is a, a PE file, not a .NET assembly. Right. You can see the difference in the file identification here. And what we wanna first typically identify then is, is it packed? Um, packing is generally done. It's usually the first thing that you have to, to defeat as you encounter it. Um, because if you don't, then you're going to be analyzing the unpacking code and, and not what was actually packed. So, you know, think of it like taking a program and, and hiding it inside another, uh, kind of like the, uh, the example that we saw there with the .NET assembly. If we didn't unravel those different stages, we wouldn't eventually get to the main functionality uh, because it's, it's sort of packed inside all those other layers. Now, um, there's some things that, that definitely we want to look for. Entropy is one of those. Uh, if we look at different sections, this is sort of a large file, so it's going to take a little bit to analyze um, because of, of this right here. Uh, we can look at sections. It calculates the entropy for us. High entropy generally means that it's, it's entropic. It's a lot of randomness, which indicates compression or encryption, um, which is a sign of, of packing. Um, the thing that really is important, though, has already been identified, and that's this resources auto IT. So PE Studio tells us right away that it identified an auto IT script inside of this particular binary. Now, auto IT is a, an IT scripting language, and I don't do much with auto IT other than with, when I see it in malware. What it can, what, what bad guys use it for is, is to create some sort of auto IT script. And then in order to distribute that script, you can actually essentially compile it into an executable. That's what we're looking at here. So let's say that we hadn't recognized that and we take our Loki bot sample to something like IDA. Here's the screen, we're loading a file. It's a PE file, so it identifies it as such. We can tell it to just go okay, load it, and then it starts the disassembly. Um, again, it's a large file, as you'll see here in just a moment. So it's gonna take a few seconds to, to analyze. Um, but if we hadn't analyzed this, and let's say we started tracing in the disassembly here, maybe with a debugger, we're, we're really in for a world of hurt. Um, because how it embeds that script is in the standalone executable. It actually takes the entire auto IT interpreter, puts that in the executable, it then loads the script as bytecode and executes that on the fly. So all of this code here that Ida is looking at, and I think the best way to, to, to visually kind of comprehend this is to look at, we're in main. So I, Ida has taken us to main. Um, and if we look at the cross references from main, you can see just by the amount of time that I'd ask to take to build this graph, we're in for, we're in for, for nothing good. Um, this will show us then all of the functions that are called from main. And that is one ominous dark blob. As you scroll in, you'll start to get a better sense of just how much functionality is here. Right. And none of this is really related to the actual script the thing that we're interested in. This is all the interpreter. So this would be pretty much entirely a waste of time, almost, if, uh, if all we were trying to do is extract that, that, that um, auto IT script. Um, so it's very important to, to use these tools to help understand and, and guide your, your next steps and the next tools and what you're doing to analyze these programs. Um, for this particular sample, what we'd want to do is see if something like uh, XE to auto IT. So this is a kind of suspicious program I downloaded, but I'm in a malware VM, so who cares? Uh, and it will hopefully identify the auto IT script, which it did. Um, it does that, it extracts it for us automatically, and then we can open this up and we can analyze it with a text editor. Um, let's do Skype, I believe is the official editor. And that also then gives us the ability to debug if we go through the, the process setting up the debugger. Um, and uh, you'll see that this is um, a pretty extensive amount of code. There's a lot of obfuscation in here. Um, 
even with that though, as you scroll to the end, you can pretty much guess that this is our PE file. It's just a matter of, of getting it out. And you know, there's, there's a number of ways to do that. Um, one way is, let's say we take a look at this value right here. Right. So this is a hex string, zero X is a prefix. Um, if we go to server shift and we don't wanna do a find replace, we don't wanna reverse, we don't wanna from base 64 to code. Uh, what we wanna do is let's get rid of some of these. Uh, from hex. There we go. Okay, so from hex, because that's hex content, so it just converts it to our ASCII string. Uh, it looks like it's, it's certainly doing something with, with DLL host. And so um, one way we could then extract this, uh, you know, we could try to step through it with a debugger. It, it actually takes a little bit to get that set up. Uh, we could try to statically understand it, pull out the content, figure out how it's obfuscated. Maybe it's just hex encoded. We could extract it that way. Um, or we could use a tool like, okay, host only. Um, like PE Civ, uh, which is created by, uh, I don't know how to pronounce her hacker handle, but Hasher Azadeh. Um, desktop uh, tools. Um, <laughs> I forgot what I would call where I put it. Hollows Hunter, that's right. So Hollows Hunter. Um, and if we're willing, uh, again, with the right environment, we could just run the program, run the malware and observe its behavior. So we'll do that. And then we'll go ahead and get process hacker open just so we can see. Stop it. Okay, so let's let Loki bot run. Okay, so there is our DLL host. Um, bad things are now happening. Um, so let's run Hollows Hunter. Uh, so that's going to go through and look for evidence of these extracted injected PE files. Um, it's just going through the process list that's running on the system. Uh, eventually, though, it'll get to the end here where our DLL host executable is, and um, it will, in fact, extract that for us. It'll tell us when something's been detected. Um, so there we go. Uh, DLL host was detected. Um, and then we have that extracted payload. So process of 1040, there it is. And I won't go into all the details of analyzing it, but um, you'll be able to see a pretty significant difference here in that when we um, look at the strings for this particular document with it being LokiBot, we'll see um, you know, all sorts of bad stuff. Here's one of the hosts that it's connecting to and it's panel, uh, you know, would appear to be registry keys, uh, maybe different passwords that it's looking at. You know, when we start to see the, the presence of, of this kind of string content, then we know that we've, we've likely been able to identify, um, at least get it unpacked and that there, there maybe isn't as much or much obfuscation left. Uh, we can also maybe just get a good idea of some of the software that it, it appears to be looking for to steal credentials. Okay, I, I tried to cram as much as I could in there into that time. Um, hopefully uh, everyone was able to, to stay with me and, and didn't get too bored. Um, I think that's it. So uh, that's all I really have. I'm, I'm more than happy to stay on um, as long as Mike as you want or anyone else that's on, um, answer any questions that I can or just discuss anything that uh, uh, I walked through today. Otherwise, um, Thank you everyone for the opportunity to, to chat with you tonight a little bit about malware. I really appreciate the opportunity um, to, to just share this with you. And if there's anything I can do now or, or in the future, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to me in, in any way possible. So, um, so thank you again. Thank you so much for the presentation tonight, Josh. We really uh, appreciate you coming in and talking for as long as you did. I, like you said, that there's just so much that can be talked about and we can go on all night, uh, but we don't want to keep everybody uh, if there's any questions, this would be a good time to ask them. I, I know I do have a, a question that maybe some, some people here want to know is, is what do you recommend for somebody who wants to get started in something like this? Is there specific books or there specific websites or trainings that people uh, could do, could, could uh, do self-talk self or anything like that? Uh, what yeah. do you recommend? 
Oh yeah. I, you know, there's a lot of resources now. Um, you know, YouTube's a great place. I've been trying to put, and I'm not trying to plug myself shamelessly, but I've been trying to add a lot of content to help with, you know, beginners uh, in, in RE and malware. So I've got some videos on YouTube. A lot of others do as well. Um, a lot of still good books, uh, the humble book bundles. If you're familiar with those, they do cybersecurity bundles all the time. And while some of the books are a bit dated now, um, there's still great resources, the uh, practical malware analysis, the Ida pro book, the Ghidra book, um, the shell coders handbook. There's just so many, so many of them out there. Um, you know, to, to me, malware analysis and, and reverse engineering has been one of those. It's been really challenging, um, especially to get to a point where you understand all of the little nuances along the way. And, and, and I can't say there's been one document that I find things in that is, or one book that taught me the bulk of what I needed to know. It's a lot of it's been trial and error. A lot of it's just been sitting up really late at night and reversing things and fumbling around. I remember the first time I, I ran into something that used auto IT. I had no idea what I was looking at. <laughs> I did a horrible job on it. Um, and so it took me some time before I puzzled that out. And so, you know, that's another thing is just to start you know, how does somebody do something? Uh, I saw researchers doing a lot of open directory um, hunting and I thought, I want to do that too. So just started doing it. And, and eventually, you know, you, you figure it out. Um, find a, a good mentor too, if you can. I think that's a great opportunity. Ask people to, to help you along the way. I think you, you talked about doing a, a CISP mentorship, you know, clubs and organizations and, and groups like this that get people and professionals, especially in the region together, are just a great opportunity to network and to get to know um, you know, what's important, what is, what is needed in industry, what should you learn, where do you even want to go with your career? You know, I, I teach students reverse engineering. There's a good portion of them every semester that come in and realize that uh, RE is not for them <laughs> and they go running away from it and maybe they'll come back to it years later, who knows? Um, but, you know, it, it can take some time too to find really where, where you want to be in, in this field. Um, I didn't start off doing reverse engineering. It's something that I, I gravitated towards slowly over my career. Oh, great advice. Um, besides yourself, are there specific people that you follow in the industry, whether that's on Twitter, LinkedIn, or other social media sites? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, Jared, Jared DeMott, I don't know how many are familiar. He's, he's been in the industry for quite some time. Um, he's been a, a friend and colleague and, and someone who's been very instrumental in my career. Uh, I guess it kind of goes to that question you just asked, you know, someone who really helped helped me figure it out and provided me some of my big breaks um, in the industry. It's, it's been him. So um, I follow Jared. I, I used to work with him. I, I don't as much anymore as, as our paths have diverged a little bit. Um, quite a few folks on Twitter um, is probably where I get most of my daily InfoSec cybersecurity news. Uh, you know, there's a couple of Jameses, James in the box and, and James uh, HMWT now, I forget his suffix, um, uh, dissect malware. I mean, there's just any number. I'm not going to remember them all, but uh, you know, certainly what I typically do is, is I look at, um, you know, people like that. I see who they follow. A lot of times they don't follow that many people. So it's not like you're trying to sift through 15,000 of people they follow, um, you know, follow them and, and see what they're contributing. And then if it, it aligns with the, the content that I want to see, I continue to follow. If not, then I, and I don't. Um, so those are, are really good resources. And, and I, I, I find sort of this more raw kind of cybersecurity stuff on Twitter um, than I do on, on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is just a slightly different platform. It, it seems more about you know, professional development and, and I try to cater the content I post there more to that anyway, but um, it, it's hard to say. I see a lot of overlap in the people I follow, but then I do have, a, I guess, a different follower set on, on LinkedIn. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, those are, are certainly some of the, the big ones. Um, you know, there's some names uh, that I've met over the years that are, are probably, you know, well-known. Um, that I work with just through some of the, the, the organizations and stuff that I, that I follow. Um, but those, because I'm, you know, I'm Victor Julian, for example, you know, he's the lead developer of Sorkata, but I work with him. So I have interests of being connected with him in a number of ways. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, how long does it go take to go from unknown binary to understood? Um, yeah. So, Unknown binary to understood, uh, boy, that's that can be difficult. Um, sometimes it is as, dang it, I keep going too far on my desktops. Uh, sometimes it's as easy as, uh, let's just pick a sample here. Um, let's go with this one. 
Okay, so PE file, so native code file. And if I go to URL house and search for it, let's see what we get. Ah, Emotet, <laughs> right? And um, had I not used URL house, I probably would have been able to look at the network analysis. And uh, yeah, that looks like Emotet um, just because of these patterns. So sometimes it's really easy. Uh, sometimes it's incredibly difficult. I would say that if I didn't have that and I had to really tackle the, the, the binary itself, um, you know, I'm trying to develop my own Yara SIGs to help much like you see in like PE Studio, PE Studio has these signatures that, that um, are, are, are able to help identify packers and other things. Um, that can be something that can be very valuable uh, to build up, um, but uh, it, it can take a while. And reversing a program, just, just figuring out how to unpack it can take hours. Uh, if, it's, if it's a packing technique that you haven't seen before, or it's not identified, uh, let alone then getting into that program and, and really unraveling it. And sometimes it's just, it's just so complicated. The obfuscation they use, they use a custom virtual machine or something. It's just, it's like, unless you're going to dedicate months of your life to it, it's just not going to be worth it. So it could be pretty substantial. you offer any classes online? <laughs> uh, do I? Yeah, um, I, I do. Um, so I do uh, some contents uh, courses on Pluralsight. Uh, it's, a, it's a paid platform, um, but I have a number of, of free trials if anybody'd like to ping me. I'm happy to, to share what I have left. Um, I do workshops here and there, uh, but either between just kind of my own under my own brand, kind of like this, and then with some of the orgs I work with, uh, mainly with, with, with Suricata. Um, and then I have started offering my own trainings. Um, I had my first training this summer at Ring Zero with uh, Samil uh, and his team. And then um, Hack in the Box has been another uh, that I'll be offering a couple of courses here in October. So um, hopefully we'll be doing a little bit more next year and, and definitely looking forward to a in-person and uh, virtual balance. Uh, so hopefully that resumes in the near future. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for asking. I warned you all I could talk for a long periods of time. It's getting really dark in here. I'm not used to being <laughs> this. I just realized that's like I'm sitting in the dark. I'm not, it's not actually that dark, but my camera is just not picking it up. So I apologize for that. That was a remarkable amount of information and, and uh, really fascinating. And uh, you explained it very well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Is that better? Oh, that's a little better. All right, we'll do one more call out. Are there additional questions? Just a question about, is Zeek something you use as well? Because that's one of those things that's used to extract HTTP sessions, things like that. Do you find any use for it for malware analysis? Um, so uh, I, I do actually, um, I don't use, uh, I don't use Zeek, I, I use Suricata. Um, Suricata pretty much does everything that Zeek does in terms of protocol, um, protocol parsing, protocol logs, session logs, flow, uh, it's all there. And so, and since it also does IDS, and of course, again, my bias, um, that's generally what I use. Um, I don't do any like Suricata, you can extend the engine via Lua, uh, you know, Zeek you have, and I've never actually worked with it, but it has its own scripting engine that you, I know you could do some pretty awesome things, but um, for my malware analysis stuff, I just generally don't need it. Um, I tend to use uh, another distro for, you know, some of my other analysis, uh, Selks, uh, these are the guys that are also part of the Suricata team. Um, it's a, it's, it's really designed to showcase Suricata, um, but what you'll find with it is, or what I use it for is it's got an elk stack as, as the name implies, uh, Moloch's set up, there's Kibana, there's a bunch of built-in dashboards and visualizations. Um, I have a real simple script that takes the P, a PCAP and, and runs it through Surrey uh, that populates the IDS alerts. And then Evebox is a lightweight web UI that allows to parse the protocol logs. 
Um, and so then I can dig into, you know, TLS, J3, whatever I need to from there, if the information is in, in Cuckoo or if I just can't extract it from a PCAP. So um, I do find that I, I do use something very similar to Zeek, um, but uh, since Surrey does it all for me, that's typically what I use. Gotcha. I didn't realize those were interchangeable. That reminds me of another question I was going to ask earlier and I forgot. Uh, that interchangeable aspect of Ida Pro and Ghidra, where do you see the pros and cons between those two? Uh, well, definitely with, with Ghidra, it's open source and it's, there's no cost to it. So that's definitely a big pro. Um, you know, I think that's going to really uh, you know, help it to, to, to we're going to see a lot more universities using it, a lot more students. It's going to be accessible to anybody who wants to get into RE uh, because they don't have to pay for it. And, and so I think that's a really, you know, a, a really the concern important being, thing. of course, that, that, you know, people see it came from the NSA, so they don't want to use it for that reason. Yeah. But yeah. do you see feature differences between them? Um. Yeah, I mean, definitely with with Ida, um, it's 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 far more robust and mature. Um, I think the probably the biggest thing that impacts me on a daily basis. I haven't had a chance. I don't have the decompiler anymore, um, and so I haven't really been able to compare that. Uh, but the signatures, Ida just still does a better job of detecting functions, library functions, getting you into main. Um, I don't, you know, you may have noticed that earlier, but uh, when we jumped into Ida in uh, one of these binaries, um, it took us to main. Uh, well, main's not actually the entry point. Start is the entry point. And so there's typically some code between main and start. Um, and if you don't recognize that, then you're, you're again, you're, you're probably analyzing a bunch of uh, compiler generated stuff, which you don't want to look at. So things like that, I find Ida is, is, is still really good at. Um, Ida has a debugger, debugger integration. So the free versions, it's, it's somewhat limited, but with the PITLA license versions, you can use uh, Win, WinDebug. Um, and so that integration works pretty nicely. So I don't know, I'm, I'm certainly going back and forth between the two and with my position and role at the university and, and our affiliation with the NSA there, I'm, I'm using it more just, if anything, to help the handful of students that we have going to the agency every year as part of their, <laughs> part of their employment. Thank you. That really helps to understand the feature difference. And I, I've been told it was more robust and of course the debugger piece, but uh, you know, starting at main is, that's a big difference. You're going to have to know, you could, you could get, you could get tripped up by that. So that, that's a big deal. Thank you. Yeah. Right. And, and things like this, I, you know, I guess I haven't, I can't recall now, uh, you know, C++ stuff, uh, detecting objects and constructors and some of those things can also be um, the demangling. All that information typically is in, in your C++ binary. So being able to demangle some of that for you, um, I'm not sure how good, good Ghidra is with that quite yet. Um, you know, with the free version though, with Ghidra, it's, it's supports a lot of architectures where with the free versions of Ida, it's typically only 32 bit. I think there's some 64 bit support now, um, but Intel. So you know, if you want to start poking around an arm or you want to start poking around on some other, some other architecture, it's, it's going to be challenging to get started there. Um, there are other tools, of course, um, uh, uh, radar and binary ninja and, and, and others cutter cutters is a pretty nice platform. Um, so there's, there's quite a few options now. But these two, I think, are, are going to be the most recognizable and, and the ones really to learn if you're getting started. All right. Okay. So you've certainly given us a lot of information to digest in just a little over two hours. So I really appreciate that again. Thank you for from the whole group, everybody who attended. I um, think we'll go ahead and call it a night here. And I'm going to take back the hosting from you, Josh. Okay. Don't mind. I'll stop my screen share. Actually, I think you need to give it back to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, I probably do, don't I? I don't think I can take it. From, you know. um, there you go. Oh, great. You know, once you get admin privileges, it's hard to give them up. It is, definitely. And uh, I mean, that's one of the things that we are seeing uh, some companies do now, too. I mean, getting off on a different tangent is that 
uh, you know, you shouldn't have 100% admins 100% of the time, right? So, <laughs> right. so giving somebody admin, it should only be for a limited amount of time with a specific scope, and then that expires and it and goes away. I think that's one of the one of the things that we see with with some of these breaches going on is that an admin existed out there that never got uh, locked back up, that was active, maybe even the person's no longer at the company. Uh, so there's no user auditing going on either uh, mm -hmm. to, show, to show that they need to deactivate um, accounts. But yeah, that's that's for yet another discussion. Um, yeah, I would, the only thing I'd ask, uh, I, I accidentally flipped to my desktop once or twice. Um, I'm happy to, if you, if you want to share the recording, um, to go back through and edit those out, or if you don't mind doing that. Um, I don't think there's anything too significant on there, of course, but uh, um, it'd just be better. I'd feel more comfortable <laughs> if I, my desktop did pop up three or four times throughout that, pre that, that presentation. So um, two hours, gosh, I know that's a pain. So like I said, I'm, I'm more than happy to do that um, and, uh, and then kick back and edit a copy to you. If, I, I don't know what you plan on sharing the video. Um, did you have a platform that you share that on or do you just distribute like a, an MP4? We'll be sharing it over onto YouTube. On YouTube, okay. Yeah. So yeah, as, as soon as the processing gets done with the recording, uh, then I can sh drop it in a file share somewhere for you. Uh, you're going to be much more familiar with picking out where it showed your desktop than I would be. So no, it's going to be painfully <laughs> slow because <laughs> I'm not going to remember. But um, yeah, I mean, when I'm flipping back and forth, is likely where it's going to be, and I know I did it three or four times. So uh, it, yeah, no, no problem. I'm happy to do that um, and just uh, to, to just crop those uh, those those few blurbs out. Uh, like I said, there's nothing on my desktop I really care about, but. Um, I don't know, just feel a little more comfortable if it wasn't there. Sure. Okay. And then I can kick that over to you. So I'll get that turned around right away. All right. And I am going to go ahead and stop the recording now.